You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 21st, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, occupational asthma. Our presenter is Dr. David Bernstein. He's a professor emeritus of medicine in the Division of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine in Cincinnati, Ohio. First, um, the month is getting away from us really quickly. Um, we have two great talks this morning. Um, the first is by Dr. David Bernstein, who's Professor Emeritus of Medicine at the Division of, of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology at the University of Cincinnati. <clears throat> Dr. Bernstein is well known as an expert in occupational asthma and has talked on uh, COLA a number of times in the past. I think he's one of the original people that we set the summer series almost 10 years ago um, that um, was one of the first people to speak. So I appreciate um, Dr. Bernstein sticking with us and updating us as the years go by. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Bernstein talk to us today about occupational asthma. I'll let you take it away, David. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. And I enjoy doing this every year, of course. What I'd like to do is introduce you to um, to the area of occupational asthma. And uh, this is an area that uh, allergists and immunologists uh, are likely to encounter. And uh, we need to really be attuned to uh, some of the factors that can cause asthma in the workplace. So we're gonna hopefully introduce you to that and provide you with some functioning knowledge of how to approach uh, new cases of occupational asthma. So we'd like to First, uh, define occupational asthma, recognize the uh, causes, and describe uh, a rational approach to evaluating occupational asthma, which can be done uh, essentially by any uh, allergist or pulmonologist, uh, given uh, available tools that we have, and then talk about interventions at the end. So um, occupational asthma <clears throat> is the most common uh, form of occupational lung disease. Uh, it has been estimated in some surveys that up to 15% of all asthmatics, um, their asthma is affected, either caused or affected by some occupational exposure. And it's important to diagnose occupational asthma. That is asthma induced by a workplace exposure uh, because uh, what we've learned over the years is that early diagnosis is important because failure to diagnose with persistent exposure to, say, a sensitizing agent in the work environment can lead to uh, more severe and persistent asthma. Uh, the prevalence of occupational asthma really varies from industry to industry depending on the um, exposure. In this case, we have a list of different respiratory occupational sensitizers, and you can see uh, wood dust, uh, particularly red cedar, is a common, um, is like a not, unco not uncommon cause of occupational asthma among people that are exposed to wood dust in uh, lumber industries, for instance. And uh, surveys have shown 5% of exposed workers uh, will develop occupational asthma. Those individuals who have um, inhalational exposure to isocyanates and they work with urethanes or urethane paints, for instance, about two to five percent of chronically exposed workers uh, can develop occupational asthma. For those of individuals who work in animal care facilities and exposed to mammalian furry animal allergens, for instance, uh, exposure can affect and sensitization can affect six percent of exposed uh, workers. And you can see for bakers, uh, we're talking about uh, protein allergens that they're exposed to, the prevalence is higher. And the highest prevalence has been reported in a rare occupation, that is platinum refining workers, up to 30 to 50% of those individuals can develop, have, have were shown to develop occupational asthma. So we talk about uh, defining 
occupational asthma, we, we have to think and break it down. Uh, because uh, we like to really think of the term work-related asthma, which could include occupational asthma induced by a condition at work, but also work-related asthma could describe individuals with pre-existing asthma uh, in whom their asthma is aggravated by a workplace exposure, like an irritant or cold air or something of that nature. But these are patients who may have, for instance, allergic asthma pre-existing who come to work environment exposed to something that causes them to wheeze, for instance. And then when we talk about uh, inducers of occupational asthma, uh, we think of those that are sensitizers and uh, sensitizers encountered at work. These can be chemicals, and we'll talk about those, or protein sensitizers. And the other cat subcategory of occupational asthma is uh, occupational asthma induced by a large irritant exposure. So this is a condition we often refer to as reactive airways dysfunction syndrome, in which there is a sudden high level exposure uh, and thereafter the patient develops an asthmatic uh, syndrome. So there's no latency period of exposure, whereas if you're talking about a sensitizer, usually there's a latency period of exposure during which time workers become sensitized and then after months or years can then develop occupational asthma. And so here's the uh, definition of uh, occupational asthma that uh, is something that we've worked with. For those of us who work in this field, uh, we define it as variable airflow obstruction, airway inflammation uh, attributable to a particular exposure in a workplace and not to stimuli encountered outside the workplace to really distinguish it from work aggravated asthma. So again, uh, occupational asthma induced by a sensitizer that uh, is usually uh, exposed, the worker is exposed by inhalation or chronic inhalation. Uh, there's usually that latency period of months of asymptomatic uh, period when the worker doesn't have symptoms and during which time presumably they're becoming sensitized to something at work. And then once sensitization develops, very low exposures of the causative sensitizer can trigger asthma symptoms at work, cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, the whole gamut. And this can occur both at work and after the worker comes home. So there could be a late asthmatic response even after they, they, they come home. They can last for some time. Usually these are uh, occupational proteins. We call these high molecular weight allergens and complex proteins with, uh, with allergens. And these, in these workers, you can easily demonstrate uh, cutaneous, percutaneous or prick test sensitization. And uh, we like to also measure uh, specific IgE in the serum. Uh, but that sensitization uh, doesn't necessarily prove that the patient has occupational asthma. And we'll talk about that. And then chemical causes, which there are a considerable number of uh, reactive chemicals that can cause occupational asthma. And these appear to be less likely to be um, Ig mediated. So it's rare for these types of sensitizers to small molecular weight, low molecular weight chemicals, for instance, that you're able to show, uh, demonstrate a positive skin test or um, uh, elevated serum specific IgE, although there are some examples where you can. And again, uh, because uh, this is uh, develops in those people that are sensitized, it doesn't affect the, the large proportion of the workforce, usually a minority of workers who are exposed or affected. In terms of the acute irritant-induced occupational asthma, which is important to recognize, we refer to this as uh, RADS, or reactive airways uh, dysfunction syndrome. Uh, there's no uh, prior history of asthma uh, and that there's a s acute high-level exposure in the work environment to an irritant. It could be chlorine, it could be smoke inhalation, it could be any type mm -hmm. of irritant that uh, could cause uh, airway uh, injury. And then uh, these patients develop very uh, soon persistent respiratory symptoms of cough that begins within 24 hours after this accidental exposure. Um, they usually have normal chest x-ray, they, they do have normal chest x-rays, and uh, you then can demonstrate either that they have asthma 
uh, by reversibility in FEV1 uh, or a positive methylcholine test would be uh, sufficient to establish the diagnosis of uh, RADS or acute irritant-induced asthma. And again, this is a retrospective diagnosis usually. So uh, work uh, exacerbated asthma not induced by workplace conditions, uh, usually in a setting where a patient may have preexisting allergic asthma or also could have eosinophilic asthma preexisting. And then, for instance, when there's some exposure, like exercise or exposure to cold air or an irritant, they develop bronchospasm. And this is important to distinguish from occupational asthma. Uh, due to a sensitizer, as the management is quite different than if you have a sensitizer, you're likely to want to remove the individual from exposure to that sensitizer. But if you're merely aggravating the symptoms of asthma, pre-existing asthma at work, uh, you can undertake measures uh, to allow the worker to usually stay at least close to the workplace, but prevent exposure or uh, step up treatment. And here are some of the triggers of work aggravated asthma. As you can imagine, the chemicals encountered at work that are irritants, uh, dust. Dust can be very irritating. Um, environmental tobacco smoke, like bar workers, for instance, or people that work in bars. This is a big problem, or was a big problem prior to uh, the ban on smoking in bars. Uh, combustion products of people uh, who are exposed to uh, combustion products on a regular basis. And you can see the product cleaning products are a big one um, and um, so on and so forth. So when you think about occupational asthma, that is asthma that is caused by workplace exposure, you have to consider in the differential diagnosis work aggravated, work exacerbated asthma. This usually can be accomplished by taking a very careful medical history and uh, determining if the patient has a pre-existing history, for instance, of allergic asthma, and then um, the symptoms are aggravated at work, um, that's pretty easy to determine. The patient might have underlying COPD, which is uh, can be confused with asthma. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a much more severe type of injury to the airways that it can occur with uh, exposure to very uh, high levels of irritants or even caustic substances that can actually cause bronchiolitis obliterans. And this is fixed airway obstruction, uh, not asthma, not reversible. And um, this uh, one example of this is uh, diacetyl, which was used, uh, chemical used to make, um, um, for popcorn to make the, um, uh, the oil in say uh, Jiffy Pop, for instance. Uh, diacetyl uh, with uh, high exposure, uh, this caused an outbreak of bronchitis obliterans, uh, which was uh, well published and well noted in the literature. Uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which can cause symptoms, respiratory symptoms at work, but you're looking for pneumonitis, uh, some uh, infiltrative disease, and in occupational asthma, the lungs are clear on x-ray. Organic toxic dust syndrome, which is a uh, toxic response to endotoxin, which can be encountered at high levels, say, in workers, uh, farm workers who work with grain and exposed to endotoxin and grain dust. Uh, the, this endotoxin can cause release of uh, cytokines in the lung, causing flu-like or febrile symptoms, but this is a toxic response. It's not sensitization or uh, occupational asthma. And what we're seeing more of is uh, patients with inducible um, vocal cord uh, dysfunction or paradoxical vocal cord dysfunction in response to uh, irritants or even uh, scents in the workplace. Uh, this, again, could be confused for occupational asthma. So in approaching the uh, diagnosis of occupational asthma, we've developed an algorithm, and this is widely published uh, with myself, my colleagues share this algorithm, recognizing that um, we can't really do uh, inhalation challenge studies if we say identify a chemical sensitizer or some sort of sensitizer. We're no longer able to do um, inhalation challenge studies to confirm a diagnosis, which is something we used to do. 
but the regulatory climate in the U.S. does not permit that anymore. So we really have to rely on uh, trying to establish a diagnosis while the worker is still at work and symptomatic. And so this uh, stepwise algorithm that we've developed is shown in this slide. We begin with, of course, taking a careful medical history. And if the history is consistent with occupational asthma and work-related occupational asthma, and we can identify a specific exposure associated with the risk worker symptoms, uh, the next step then is to, um, is to try and establish whether the worker has or doesn't have asthma. And we can do that, uh, one, by just trying to confirm reversibility with spirometry before and after inhaled bronchodilator. If that is not possible or the patient has normal lung function when they're evaluated, uh, one other method that we use is a methylcholine test with which uh, tests for nonspecific bronchial high responsiveness. And uh, if the worker uh, has a positive methylcholine test, and if, say, we had a threshold of uh, 4 milligrams per ml or lower, um, that uh, would be very suggestive of an asthma diagnosis. Uh, and then, if possible, uh, and then we identify, for instance, a high molecular weight allergen protein sensitizer, we might at this uh, stage want to also test the worker for sensitization. And skin testing isn't widely available for a lot of these things. Uh, there aren't commercial reagents for most occupational allergens. We end up often preparing our own in the clinic, which is quite easy to do. Um, and uh, we, if we see a positive skin prick test, it's certainly supportive of sensitization. Uh, but the uh, standard for really demonstrating whether or not the patient uh, has, say if we develop, we demonstrate sensitization, we still have to show whether or not there is actually changes in lung function at work uh, associated with exposure to the suspect sensitizer. So to do this, we do serial evaluations of lung function, usually peak expiratory flow rates, which are reliable to do, both at work for two weeks and away from work for another two weeks, and we compare the results. Of course, if we see a, a decrement in lung function at work, which improves away from work, that pretty much confirms the diagnosis. So here is a, a sample of the type of questionnaire that we do uh, for an occupational medical history when we suspect occupational asthma. And you can see in the slide, we asked the patient if he's uh, recently been transferred from a job and is there any new exposures that he's encountered, which uh, have corresponded to onset of symptoms. We ask about, while you're on your current job, do you experience any of these uh, chin symptoms? It's typical of asthmatic symptoms. And then we ask if these symptoms do begin uh, after work, do they begin immediately? So, you know, we, talk, we think about these occupational sensitizers can cause both immediate and late phase asthmatic responses. And in some cases, they can uh, we won't detect an immediate response, but we'll see an la isolated late phase response. So it's important to capture this in the history. Do these start immediately within an hour after beginning work, or do they begin only after starting work, which is also a possibility? And then how many hours and how many hours do these symptoms last at work and away from work? Do they get better on the weekend? So it's important to establish if the symptoms improve on weekends or vacations and again, that's supportive, that's history that's supportive of occupational asthma. And here again are just some of the points I already made. Um, symptoms can actually begin within months after a job change or new agent is introduced. I'm talking about that latency period of sensitization to a chemical or a protein sensitizer at work. Um, so it's not unusual to see workers at work for years and then develop all of a sudden uh, sensitivity to something they're working with. Uh, it's also important to collect because many of these workplaces, occupational workplaces, are quite complex and the worker may be using multiple chemicals or multiple um, types of uh, products uh, to produce something. So it's important to collect uh, material safety data sheets uh, to really get a uh, complete look at what they're exposed to. And aha, uh, you may re recognize a known uh, occupational asthmogen in that group. And that will at least give you a, a lead. 
And uh, again, we talked about improvement away from work, and we asked about are other workers affected, and have other workers left because of similar symptoms. And this speaks to what we call a survivor effect, that there may have been many workers or other workers sensitized prior to your worker coming for an evaluation who left the workplace because of occupational asthma, which was not recognized. So, um, so again, this is the the uh, the um, algorithm which you already reviewed, and uh, immunologic assessment. Uh, as I said before, uh, if you demonstrate a positive skin prick test, say to a uh, protein like uh, a mouse allergen, for instance, an animal care worker, uh, sensitization sensitization by itself does not confirm a diagnosis of occupational asthma. You have to go through a process and demonstrate work-related reduction in lung function. Mm -hmm. um, in vitro tests, again, some would be available, for instance, for a mouse or a rat. So that, that may be a scenario where you can measure a specific IgE. I know for some of the chemicals, there are some commercial assays, like for trimolytic anhydride or phthalic anhydride, uh, but those are limited. And we, we often involve, make our own natural extracts from the uh, materials that we collect at work, and uh, we can safely do a skin prick test. Of course, we don't do intradermal tests, but we can do a prick test, and that may be very helpful in some scenarios. There are some chemical sensitizers in which uh, certain laboratories and certain centers have produced their own allergens uh, to, uh, with, with chemicals. So the way to produce a complete allergen, because the chemical by itself is not usually reactive or form the allergen, but it combines or haptonizes and conjugates with an autologous protein. So what many of us have done in this area over the years, we can conjugate or bind these reactive chemicals with human serum albumin and uh, use this then to characterize these um, conjugates and can use these as test antigens for specific IgE in many cases or even for skin testing. And in some workers, we see very nice positive uh, skin prick tests and elevated specific IgE, particularly for the acid anhydride uh, group of chemicals. And it's not, sometimes we see it with, with the isocyanate, uh, which is a common cause of occupational asthma. Okay, this is just, again, a picture of spirometry, which, again, is that second step. Uh, you want to prove or rule out asthma, um, but in initial evaluation, uh, this is useful, and this just shows um, reversibility testing. And um, a normal test, of course, does not exclude asthma, and, uh, but a positive test, obviously, is, is supportive. But once you have that diagnosis of asthma, it doesn't prove occupational asthma. Uh, it could still be uh, work-related asthma, and then you need to, um, to go on with the algorithm and test further. Here's a, a diagram showing the methylcholine inhalation challenge test. I don't know if the Manu fellows are familiar with this, but um, uh, methylcholine is a FDA-approved <clears throat> um, agonist for uh, we used uh, for challenge to demonstrate bronchial hyperresponsiveness in patients, and uh, this can be quite useful uh, for occupational asthma if uh, the spirometry is normal and you want to see if the patient is hyperresponsive. Uh, this is a useful test. You can also use it if you have a patient who's exposed and symptomatic, and if they have a negative methylcholine test after being at work, say coming right off the work shift and you do a methylcholine test and it's negative, that may help you exclude occupational asthma. You may not even need to go further. So here is a simple uh, peak flow rate uh, uh, device and uh, it's a mini right peak flow meter. We like to use this one and we can train the worker with adequate supervision to perform this reliably and to get reproducible measurements. We, uh, but it's very important while you're doing this monitoring at work for uh, up to four weeks to uh, train and retrain to make sure that the, the patient, the worker is doing it correctly 
and this has been criticized, uh, I think, in other scenarios as not being reliable, uh, but, and then the worker could always falsify the results. Uh, if you had a, a, you have devices now, electronic peak flow meters that have chips, so that would address that concern. But uh, we like it, and with adequate training, supervision, we get very reliable results from these kinds of tests. And of course, <clears throat> the, uh, the technique is so important. It obviously requires a maximal expiratory effort, and we tell the patient to hold the device level and not to block the air holes in the back. You stand up, take a deep breath, cover your mouth completely around the mouthpiece, and then blow as hard and as fast as you can no need to have a long exhalation, and then we have them reset, read the device, read the measurement, and then reset and do this uh, three times at each measurement. When you're doing the monitoring of the peak flow at work, away from work, it's recommended you do this every uh, four hours, um, but uh, most work many workers can't do this, so a minimum of four measurements per day while at work is as useful as suitable. And again, you do it for two weeks uh, during the work shift and then two weeks away from exposure to the suspect agent. And, uh, and they should be uh, done before they take their asthma medication. So you don't want a patient taking their albuterol before they do their peak flow measurement, for, instance, for example. And uh, then they also need to record symptoms as well at the same time that they take their peak flow readings. And here's how we analyze the, this. One way we analyze this data is we, uh, we then determine, based on the 24 hours, the peak flows that we've obtained. For instance, we have four measurements um, <clears throat> during this day. Uh, we, do, we calculate the percent daily variability over 24 hours, which is simply done by subtracting uh, the minimum reading uh, from the maximum reading uh, divided by the maximum peak flow reading in liters uh, per minute and um, and then calculating percent variability. And you can see there are days when uh, we don't see anything. Um, this may be a day away from work. And then you can see clearly when the patients at work, uh, there's 20% variability. So there's clearly a dip during the work shift from baseline. And this is reflected uh, in this uh, variability. We consider anything above 20% usually pretty uh, significant uh, in terms of daily uh, diurnal variability. And again, these uh, should normalize for two weeks, the two-week period that the patient's not exposed. Another way of analyzing these data is simply by visual inspection. So one can plot the maximal peak flow rate. We take the maximum peak flow rate not, we don't take an average, we take the maximum peak flow for any time point of the three uh, measurements, we take the maximal peak flow, and then we can plot these uh, over time, and you can see that for period at work, this worker has a definite uh, decrement in values, and this improves away from work, and then declines again when at work. Uh, this is from a publication, Dr. Mallow's group, and uh, then uh, one of the things we can do to uh, verify that the patient hasn't falsified their readings is do a methylcholine test at the end of this uh, period. And you can see it's quite abnormal. The peak flow of the PC20 is below one milligram per ml, which is quite abnormal. And then uh, we can repeat it again after a period away from work. You can see there's clearly a difference that it's improved significantly as have the peak flow rates and the symptoms of the, of the patients when they're not exposed at work. And this really validates uh, these peak flow readings very well. And again, as I said, they do have electronic devices with memory chips that uh, can be used, uh, which should also address that potential issue. Sometimes we do do that. And again, uh, this is a study comparing the uh, interpretation of these peak flow results, and they compared in this study in workers with confirmed occupational asthma. These were confirmed by inhalation challenge testing, which is considered the gold standard. And they found that the visual analysis, just by visually having, um, say, naive physicians who don't know or naive to the case to, uh, to make an assessment, the visual analysis of the serial 
peak flow rates had uh, pretty good sensitivity and specificity, actually uh, better than the uh, just calculating the percent amplitude or the percent variability um, and other methods. Um, the visual analysis performed the best. As I said, um, again, methylcholine tests can be useful in validating the peak uh, flow rates, but the other point is uh, that if the methylcholine test is negative and you have a high PC20 uh, after the work has been at work and exposed for two weeks um, and you have a normal methylcholine, you really have to suspect you know, the veracity of the peak flow measurements. So uh, there have been some studies showing that a high PC20 of greater than 16 can actually exclude occupational asthma confirmed by uh, specific inhalation challenge or by, by ruling it out. Actually, in patients who had negative specific inhalation challenges, they almost always have a negative uh, methylcholine test. So that can be used in that way as well. So uh, let's turn to a case, and I know it's hard for this to be uh, interactive, uh, but I don't know if there are any fellows that are listening uh, who might want to pipe in. Um, I, I don't know if we have that capability, but anyway, I'll present the case, and if I hear from you, I'll, we'll, we'll stop. But uh, this is a 42-year-old uh, uh, male worker with a two-year history of asthma. And uh, he's been working uh, as a spray painter in an automobile body shop, and he works with two-part urethane paints. One part uh, is containing hexamethylene um, uh, diastocyanate. And after eight months on the job, uh, he begins to notice wheezing and shortness of breath uh, that begins one to three hours after he starts working and then continues for a long time after leaving work, so up to 12 hours after leaving work. So he, can, he has these late symptoms that continue. And we do a spirometry when we first evaluate him, show that he has um, reversible airway obstruction uh, by the spirometry test, and he wants to apply for workers' compensation. Uh, so the question is, what is the likely uh, cause? Um, and I think we... I already gave it away, I think, uh, diisocyanates, um, because that's uh, it's commonly used in spray painters, and this is, a, this is a potential hazard for people that work in body shops or, or uh, involved in occupations where they're painting uh, hard metal surfaces. Now, how best, how do we confirm the diagnosis from here? Anybody there? Does, any ideas? I hear silence. Here's this gentleman who is uh, who is doing this type of work, and you can see he's using this urethane paint. There's uh, two components. There's a uh, monomer, and then there's an activating agent containing the isocyanate, and it, it polymerizes into a very hard uh, surface paint when it hits the coating, when it hits the uh, the metal. And these are very good paints, and very they they last a long time. So that's why. They like, we like to use them, and this individual is doing this, but he's wearing pretty good uh, protective equipment, including a, a respirator. And so um, the isocyanates are uh, shown here. They're chemical structures. Uh, Tyuene diisocyanate was the initial one that was discovered as early as World War II when they used it to make urethane foam products for the war effort. And... Uh, Early on, they noticed that many of the workers uh, were exposed to this very volatile chemical developed occupational asthma, so it was a real issue. Uh, since then, uh, most of the use of isocyanates have transitioned to less volatile uh, substances, I'm sorry, like this uh, methylene diphenyl diisocyanate. The isocyanate group is shown here, NCO, and this uh, is, uh, these are mostly bifunctional on a on the molecule, and methylene diphenyl diisocyanate is used to make um, urethane foam products of all sorts uh, in your car, for instance, or if you put insulation to your home. Uh, the urethane they spray into the walls, uh, they use methylene diphenyl diisocyanate. So some of those workers 
are at risk for occupational asthma. And here's this uh, hexamethylene HDI, which is the spray paint hardening agent that is used. And uh, you can see it's not an aromatic ring structure, um, but a, um, nevertheless a sensitizer. And uh, at one time, isocyanates uh, in the 1990s were like high on the list in terms of causing new cases of occupational asthma uh, in different countries in the developed world, but in the U.S. especially, but now they've come down um, recently, not as frequently, but still we see cases. And so, again, I showed you this slide before, but this would be the method you would use to confirm occupational asthma. You've demonstrated asthma, you have an occupational history, and now you need to show that there's a change in asthma in the workplace. Uh, now, in some centers, they can do uh, specific inhalation challenging, which would be even better, but in the U.S., we're not able to do this. And here's a, a uh, picture of a specific inhalation uh, challenge chamber. And what happens is, uh, this is uh, something that's used for uh, isocyanates, uh, that the um, uh, the uh, vapors or our generator fumes are generated in a chamber and then continuously monitored so they can very precisely define uh, an exposure and you usually want to use uh, a non-irritating exposure uh, something like uh, two or three parts per billion initially and then the worker who's being challenged, there, you take lung function tests before, uh, a spirometry tests, and then do the challenge for a short period of time and then measure uh, serial FEV1 for hours after the challenge test. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do this in the U.S., but this is the most accurate specific way of confirming occupational asthma to say isocyanates or some other chemical agents. And here is uh, some of the data uh, from Dr. Mallow and Cartier's group in Canada that they generated from workers who were exposed to isocyanates. And you can see their different patterns of responses that they were able to document. Of course, uh, there's an immediate early response. Without a late uh, response, there can be an early late response, which begins at three hours. And then what's really interesting in about 40% uh, of these workers, they see this isolated late phase response. So it takes a long time before the workers uh, develop symptoms, uh, meaning after they're exposed at work, so they could actually not begin to have problems until, say, at the end of the work shift, and then have a lot of trouble when they go home. So you have to be aware that just because it doesn't start within the first seven hours at work, it could certainly still be occupational asthma. And then, of course, the biphasic response is not uncommon either. But you see this a lot with chemicals. You don't see it too much with high-protein allergens. And here are some of the uh, common uh, causes of, uh, of occupational asthma. And um, this is, um, again, I mentioned the isocyanates, and these are important. So you have to get a careful history and know what job the work is doing, and if you identify their exposed isocyanates, it's, certainly, it's definitely something you should pursue. And again, we usually deal now with diphenyl, uh, methylene diphenyl diisocyanate or um, exylene HDI are the things that we usually are doing. By the way, these are also used to produce adhesives too, so people manufacturing very uh, strong industrial adhesives could also be exposed to isocyanates. Um, trimalic and high acetone hydrides, these are the ones that we talked about. These can act as very good uh, haptins, and uh, by combining with autologous proteins like HSA, can form allergenic determinants on the protein and can be very potent allergens, and you can often demonstrate uh, in some of these workers positive skin prick tests or uh, elevated serum-specific IgE, and these can be very clinically useful. Uh, but again, this is rare in terms of the chemical sensitizers. There's another example is uh, individuals exposed to wood dust and the active chemical which causes uh, the, the asthma is thought to be this organic acid, plicatic acid, something to remember. You may see this in the future. 
And again, this is seen among sawmill workers and carpenters involved with uh, cedar dust, red cedar dust. It could be also seen with eastern cedar as well. Um, Colophony electronic soldering workers, for instance, who are exposed to fumes from uh, soldering fluxes. These are made from colophony, which is a wood product, and they have organic acids, uh, abiotic pimeric acids, which can also be the, the key uh, trigger or asthmogen in these cases. Uh, another example is uh, methyl methacrylate used by healthcare workers in ORs, for instance, to uh, for surgical cement, so nurses or even physicians can develop occupational asthma due to methyl methacrylate. Some other things, uh, cleaners, so uh, sulfon chloramide is a chemical sensitizer, chloramine T, which can also do this and cause occupational asthma. Uh, actually, uh, cos cosmetologists who do hair and bleaching of hair, the persulfates are a non-uncommon cause of occupational asthma. Uh, healthcare workers exposed to sterilizing solution containing uh, OPA or orthothaldehyde or glutaraldehyde, these can also be asthmogens and cause occupational asthma. Uh, crazy glue, cyanoacrylate, which is also common uh, cutaneous sensitizer in terms of causing contact dermatitis, can also um, cause occupational asthma. All right, so the next case is um, a 29-year-old baker who presents with sneezing, wheezing, and shortness of breath, working in the family bakery. Uh, he has um, a history of atopy, allergic rhinitis, and asthma during childhood. And for the last two years, he's noticed uh, wheezing and shortness of breath. When he comes to the bakery to help make dough, and there's lots of flour dust that's generated in this process. And he's uh, tested um, for uh, serial protein allergens, and he has a positive uh, skin test to uh, wheat. Well, he's tested for rye and wheat flour uh, for sensitization, and um, uh, and also amylase, which is a uh, enzyme used as a dough conditioner. So there are multiple allergens that you have to consider in bakers uh, who develop symptoms. So we see him in the clinic, and he has a normal spirometry test, so we're not able to show reversibility, and he has a positive uh, skin test to wheat and uh, rye cereal proteins that he works with both rye and wheat flour, but negative skin tests to amylase. So um, what is needed here to confirm or exclude a diagnosis of occupational asthma, because we really haven't demonstrated asthma, we've merely shown that he's sensitized to some occupational high molecular weight protein allergens. Well, we do a uh, methylcholine test, and sure enough, he's got a positive methylcholine test, so that confirms a high likelihood of asthma. And then to complete our evaluation, we do serial evaluation of uh, his peak flow rates. And actually, we used, in this case, one of those uh, electronic devices that has a memory chip to record the peak flow measurements. So these were very reliable. <clears throat> and we can see that on the days that he's working but not exposed to flour, uh, he seems to do fine, and then on that day, that Monday, you can see the precipitous drop in his peak flow, uh, and almost to a dangerous level here, and uh, he recovers mm -hmm. after treatment. So clearly, uh, we have very good evidence showing sensitization, showing that he has asthma, and he has work-related increase in his asthma symptoms at work to, to comfortably make a diagnosis of Baker's asthma or occupational asthma caused by the serial proteins encountered at work. And um, he's going to need to avoid that. He can maybe work, but it has to stay away from the flower. Here's another case of latex uh, allergy. And uh, we had the latex epidemic that was really big back in the early part of our uh, century and in, in the 90s. And uh, we had a lot of uh, healthcare workers who were exposed to gloves that were powdered gloves, and when they'd put on or take off the gloves, this would generate a lot of powder which to which the latex protein allergens would stick to, and this was a perfect storm uh, generating um, inhalational exposure to, um, to aerosols of uh, allergen. And uh, this is a nurse who was sensitized, and you can see that we did a workplace challenge, and 
uh, during a time when she was using gloves, uh, you can see what happens. Her FEV1 falls, and she gets quite sick. So uh, she has to avoid, has to be in a latex-free environment, and she gets better. So in terms of high molecular weight allergens, we have um, the no sort of a working knowledge of what's out there. Uh, enzymes, for instance, uh, bacterial enzymes, recombinant enzymes are really very potent allergens and used in a wide variety of uh, uh, industries, including detergent industries, where, as you know, your, clean, your clothes get very clean because there are enzymes in the detergents which uh, scrub away at all the, uh, all the uh, debris and the things that stick to your clothes. And they're quite effective, but the workers have to be careful because if they're exposed to dust in the manufacture of these, they have a high chance of becoming sensitized and developing occupational asthma. We talked about amylases. These are also encountered by pharmaceutical workers and individuals producing recombinant uh, protein, uh, proteins as well. Uh, in terms of animal sources, uh, uh, farmers exposed to cow dander. We know that this can cause occupational asthma. We talked about uh, laboratory animal workers and uh, workers who uh, were working in animal care facilities. Uh, individuals who process eggs, for instance, they generate lots of aerosols and they process millions of eggs in egg processing plants and in the process they're exposed to uh, aerosols and they can become sensitized to develop occupational asthma. Food processing workers who work with uh, crabs or crustaceans can also, uh, by exposure to vapors as these, uh, these, the meats from the crustaceans are boiled, they are exposed to the proteins in the vapors and can develop occupational asthma, for instance. And here's some other examples too, bakers we talked about, and uh, spice workers and printers who use vegetable gums, acacia, which is a sensitizer, papain, uh, psyllium, which is used as a um, natural um, uh, and, uh, uh, for uh, treating uh, constipation, laxative, natural laxative, and then individuals, uh, flowering workers, people that work with horticulture, work in flower shops, can also develop sensitization to proteins emanating from working with flowers. All right, so we have another case, I think, um, and uh, let's see what we are on time here. Yeah, um, this is a 26-year-old um, auto parts worker with, uh, comes into work and no history of uh, asthma prior to that, and accidentally he's processing uh, a, um, a bath uh, containing um, chromates, and in the process, he throws in some uh, material uh, that generates um, sulfur dioxide, and he's accidentally exposed to a huge cloud of sulfur dioxide fumes. And uh, this exposure occurs for about 30 minutes, and almost immediately, he develops coughing, chest tightness, and epistaxis. Uh, he's seen by the emergency room doc, and he has a normal chest x-ray, and at the time, normal lung function, but he has persistent cough and develops dyspnea on exertion for six months subsequent to that event. And so this is what? This is a case of irritant-induced occupational asthma. And what do we do next? Well, we document his symptoms, and we, uh, because spirometry wasn't uh, useful, we do a methylcholine test, and he has a positive methylcholine test, uh, which uh, I think all the um, features of uh, RADS, reactive airway dysfunction syndrome, are satisfied, as we initially said in the beginning of the talk. And uh, we uh, assign him a diagnosis of air acute irritant-induced occupational asthma. So some of the um, causes are shown here, exposure to these chemicals, floor sealants, ammonia, anything that's caustic, smoke, combustion products, just about anything can do it. So finally, we've, we've really, I think, achieved all the other objectives, and we're going to talk a little bit about what do you do for these patients. Uh, and um, so we talked about how important early diagnosis is. 
because if they're exposed and an occupational announcement is caused by a sensitizer, uh, then it's important to uh, intervene and to uh, reduce or completely eliminate exposure to the causative sensitizers. And if this is done early, the patient generally does much better, does very well. We, we found this out with isocyanates, that if you make an early diagnosis, the patient may recover 100%. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times it's not the case because uh, because of the delay in diagnosis. Um, now, we tell the worker not to be exposed, but this may involve a change in their job, which could have economic consequences, and so sometimes they'll return and not follow uh, medical advice. So that can happen. Uh, a worker who has acute irritant-induced asthma can usually safely return back to the workplace, but you have to institute measures at work or talk to the uh, the workplace managers, industrial hygienists, to prevent future events that would cause irritant exposures that could cause re another event. Other than that, these patients can usually uh, go back to work and with adequate monitoring and adequate uh, pharmacotherapy and do okay. Um, and then um, we also recommend that if we see a sentinel case, one case, we want to prevent future cases so often talk to the plant managers or the industrial hygienists about setting up some monitoring of work exposures to a known sensitizer, but also maybe even considering surveillance measures, periodic surveillance of workers to see if any new cases have developed. And that's all part of the responsibility of the physician who actually evaluates the sentinel case. So what happens? Well, we know that this is a... Um, a study that was done combining data, long-term data, of uh, individuals uh, who had an intervention who were, uh, once they were diagnosed, they were removed from the workplace. And you can see that there's a, a very steep slope of their FE1 declining at work. And once an intervention is made, there's a, certainly a trend uh, that once they're uh, removed from work, they do much better. And then the slope of their decrease in FEV1 uh, declines. So we all know that we we decrease our FEV1 decreases slowly with age, but if we have occupational asthma, it, slowly, it declines much more uh, dramatically. And so now he's sort of these workers are are just experiencing decline that's appropriate for age. So uh, exposure modification does make a difference. And primary prevention is the other thing. So I talked to you about the latex allergy and asthma epidemic we had uh, in the 90s. And uh, now we actually, um, uh, everybody's made uh, changes to the gloves. They're low-protein gloves that are used now. They're powder-free gloves. Uh, and then all kinds of um, uh, sort of redesigns of the gloves have uh, resulted in essentially gloves that no, present no uh, really substantial biologic exposure to the, to the workers. And so now you can see how many cases were seen in the 90s with the powder gloves, but prior to the interventions with changing the products, you can see almost no cases. I don't think we ever see any more cases of latex allergy or occupational asthma. <clears throat> so um, that's it. So I think that um, here are some of the other management options important to uh, optimize the asthma control, and then uh, use of uh, respirators may be appropriate in some cases if you can't completely avoid exposure, um, but uh, that's uh, more in the hands of the specialist, I think. And um, again, the problem is that when you restrict a patient or you take them out of their job, this can have negative impact on their income, regardless of whether they get workers' compensation or not, so the patient may not be highly motivated to do this. So that's something you have to deal with, really try and work with the employer to find another job so the patient's uh, income isn't compromised. And so that's one role that you can play that really will help the worker in the long term and have a positive impact on their quality of life as well and prevent them from developing severe uh, or uh, impairment from occupational asthma. Occupational rhinitis, just some words, it's two to three times more frequent than occupational asthma. 
about 12% of patients who uh, develop occupational rhinitis will go on to develop occupational asthma. Uh, when you talk about natural protein sensitizers, um, occupational rhinitis precedes occupational asthma in 58% of cases of occupational asthma. Then chemicals can also cause occupational asthma, but it's uh, not as frequent in about 25% of cases. So just uh, by way of closing, I'd like to refer you, if you want to read about this more, there's a nice, excellent chapter in Middleton. Uh, we have a book, Asthma in the Workplace, that we published in its fourth edition, preparing a fifth edition now. And then I wanted to alert you that there will be a thematic issue on occupational disorders, both occupational asthma and hypersensitivity pneumonitis and occupational contact dermatitis, which will appear in an upcoming uh, theme issue in uh, jacking practice, I think towards the end of the year. So keep your eyes open for that. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. That was great. That was great. Appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, does anyone have a question for Dr. Bernstein? We have a few minutes left here. Okay. Um, David, I have a quick question. Um, sure. I'm always curious for all the people that have had occupational asthma. Have you known anyone in all the years you've been doing this that um, had um, um, had occupational asthma was ever able to go back to doing something they were doing before? Yeah, I, you know, you see that with um, with the irritant induced asthma. So those patients that have RADS, uh, that will not necessarily, in most cases, they're able to go back to work um, as long as you carefully follow them and make sure they're not exposed to anything that would aggravate their asthma. And usually those workers actually get better. I mean, the natural history of those workers actually uh, even go into remission over, say, many years. Mm -hmm. And that's been documented in a number of studies. So, uh, but for the... Um, for the sensitizers, if they're uh, exposed, uh, yeah, if the if the employer, assuming they can find a, another building where they're not going to be exposed to the sensitizers, many times they can find alternative work uh, from the same employer. So that's that's a goal they all I want to achieve because nobody enjoys going through the workers' compensation, the expense and and the aggravation, legal aggravation that that, that entails. Um, so that's those are the scenarios we often encounter. Okay. Well, again, thank you for taking the time to speak with us this morning. It was a great talk, and we appreciate it. Um, and you have a great weekend, okay? Keep My safe. pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.